opened the box and stared at the old tapes. They were just another pile of digital junk, endless rows of bytes and pixels. But somehow, as if by magic, they preserved forgotten images of Afghanistan. I wondered, was anything on the tapes worth looking at now? Was anything worth saving or sharing? What could these abandoned images tell us more than a decade after 9-11? I had gone to Afghanistan with a photographer after the September 11 attacks on the United States. We witnessed the fall of the Taliban's main stronghold in northern Afghanistan. We interviewed everyone from Afghan refugees to Taliban fighters. I wonder now, what stories did we miss? What do we know now that we didn't know then? We had covered the war at ground level, following soldiers who belonged to the Northern Alliance as they pursued the Taliban. Some Alliance soldiers had fought against the Soviet Union. Now they were helping the U.S. military overthrow the Taliban and track down Al-Qaeda fighters. But would they find their target? One day out near the front lines, I watched as Alliance soldiers took turns shooting a Kalashnikov rifle, also known as an AK-47. One by one they aimed and fired. One by one they missed. Their target was a sardine can. No one managed to knock it down. Soldiers had a little better luck firing from point-blank range as they split logs for the evening fire. Later I spotted a man on a bridge. He was shooting into a river down below. A translator told me he was fishing. I've sometimes wondered what became of the soldiers I met in 2001. But after leaving Afghanistan, I put the war out of my mind. Some things I wanted to forget. The graphic images of war, the wounded, the desperate, and the bright red pools of blood alongside the bodies of the fallen. So I stowed my Afghanistan tapes in a cardboard box and left them there, along with the memories. The tapes sat largely undisturbed for more than a decade before I decided to reach back into the box. By the time I traveled to Afghanistan in 2001, I'd been a journalist for nearly 20 years. I'd written about all kinds of things. Sex crazed doctors, nude bars, Pope John Paul II, Cuban bikers, a masked man named Marcos, teenage thrill seekers, a death row killer named Mad Dog. I even wrote about a Florida snake that popped out of a toilet, scaring a woman half to death. But this was different. This was war. Like a lot of Americans, I was shocked and saddened by the terrorist attacks. I wanted to do something. I volunteered to cover the story. I could barely breathe. I was working as a correspondent for the Dallas Morning News. My editor asked me to travel to Uzbekistan, a former Soviet republic where we thought we could find American troops. Okay, I admit it. I had to look at a map to see where the heck Uzbekistan was located. I was on assignment in Mexico City at the time. I caught a flight to Havana, Cuba, where I was based. Then I packed and traveled to Dallas to meet with my bosses. They asked if I would take along a video camera. I knew little about video, but said, why not? While in Dallas, I also met the photographer who was assigned to the story. It was Cheryl D.S. Meyer. She was born and raised in the Philippines and moved to the U.S. with her family in 1981. I'd worked with Cheryl in Guatemala, where we did a story on the aftermath of war. Yeah, blood flowing down. I hear the blood we went to Washington to get visas to enter Uzbekistan, then headed east across the globe. We spent a few weeks reporting from Uzbekistan, then decided to make our way to Afghanistan, where the fighting had begun. We traveled through Tajikistan, the poorest republic of the former Soviet Union. We went through security checkpoints on the way, hiding our money under our clothes. We came to a river, took a ferry across, and we were finally in Afghanistan, a country about the size of Texas. 
A driver took us to a dusty settlement called Hoja Bodin, home to about 26,000 people. Cheryl wrote in an email to friends back home. I said to Tracy, you know, this is really quite rural. And he responded, rural? We're in the effing middle of nowhere. We stayed in a canvas tent at a temporary camp for journalists. I didn't have a sleeping bag, but Cheryl sweet-talked a CBS employee into selling her one, and we were all set. I filed a story for the newspaper the next day. Cheryl, a logistical whiz, found a driver and a translator. That night, a sandstorm hit. Cheryl kept a journal during the trip. She wrote, Both Tracy and I sunk deep into our sleeping bags and waited for morning. When we finally came out of our cocoons, the light filtering in was a strange color of yellow. The wind was still blowing and the atmosphere was laden with dust. The storm leveled seven of the 14 tents in our camp. It also destroyed some journalists' equipment, forcing them to leave the country. I looked around and simply wanted to cry. We looked for a more secure base of operations and found a construction site that looked promising. Workers fixed up an unfinished home for us. They covered the windows with clear plastic and put a rug on the floor. They also dug a hole in the yard. That was our toilet. Cheryl liked our new digs. It was a palace, a mud palace. We agreed to a price of $20 a day per person, and we were thrilled. We went to work setting up our gear, which included satellite phones, laptops, and a noisy Chinese gas generator. We quickly got into a routine. We'd go to the front lines before dawn to look for news. Later, we'd return to our mud palace to transmit stories. Out in the field, we often saw posters of former Northern Alliance commander Ahmad Massoud. He was assassinated two days before the September 11 attacks. His last words as his body was being loaded into a helicopter were, God is great, God is great. He had fought against the Soviets in Afghanistan. Some American officials feared that his death would cause the Northern Alliance to collapse. The CIA dispatched a team to Afghanistan to support the Northern Alliance. The CIA team reached Afghanistan on September 26 and spent $5 million in 40 days. Most of the money went to Afghan allies in the Northern Alliance, according to CIA team leader Gary Schroen. The money helped gain the support of the Northern Alliance as the U.S. prepared to unleash a bombing campaign. The CIA officer later revealed that his boss had told him, I want you to cut bin Laden's head off, put it on dry ice, and send it back to me so I can show the president. Cheryl and I saw no signs of this secret CIA mission or bin Laden. We had no idea CIA officers were meeting with Afghan warlords. We didn't see any U.S. intelligence or military personnel. We went to the front lines day after day and usually saw little more than Afghan soldiers standing around waiting or speaking into a radio. We were desperate to find news stories that would justify the enormous amount of money we were spending. $100 per day for our jeep and driver, and 100 or more per day for our translators. I visited several refugee camps. One was a patchwork of tents, caves, and mud brick shelters. It began along a riverbank and stretched for miles. Relief workers said half the children were malnourished and one in three would die before the age of five. <laughs> Graves near the camps held the bodies of people who had perished the previous winter. Another camp also had deaths. Two to three hundred people died here last year. I'm here with Abdul Baki. He's leader of a refugee camp here in northern Afghanistan. This camp has about a thousand people in it. Last year, tragedy struck. 60 people died, 40 children, 20 pregnant women. Just about all of them died either of lack of med medical care, starvation, or simply cold. And it's getting cold right now. Winter's coming. The snow's going to fall. Abdul is very worried. He's very concerned for his people. All around, I saw refugees building shelters. This man spent six days digging out his home. 
He says I dig it with a shovel. A few of the children were looking for a handout. But life is tough in Afghanistan. The average male dies before the age of 49. The average female lives to 51. One refugee came home to find his son sprawled on the frozen ground, dead. What did it was the cold, or maybe it was the hunger, he's not sure. We also visited a school and saw children who were eager to learn. Listen to these kids in the background. They love learning. I asked a class of 24 what they wanted to be, and the hands shot up. We want to be doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers. We dropped by other places too, a mosque, markets, cafes. That helped give us a sense of what life is like in Afghanistan. There was a lot about the way of life and the culture in Afghanistan that we didn't understand. Some of my story ideas weren't the greatest. Like the time I said a remote Afghan field depot you know, reminded me of the movie Mad Max Afghan. Beyond Thunderdome. In northern Afghanistan, sometimes I feel like in a scene from Road Warrior. Fuel is scarce, and this fuel depot can be seen for miles. I watched soldiers repair trucks and learn to drive tanks. I'm here at a tank operator training course. If there's such a thing as grinding the gears with a tank, that's what they're doing here. I saw a lot of donkeys and hated to see them abused. Look at this donkey. Someone cut off its ear. I'm told that the Taliban may have done it. Its owner probably was bringing supplies on this donkey to the Northern Alliance. You know, they say money makes the world go round. But here in Afghanistan, I think donkeys make the world go round. I don't know what people would do without these things. They carry their firewood, their wheat, they go from village to village. It's a thankless job. At least that's what I think donkeys would tell me if they could. These donkeys, they have to, they get shoved out of the way when a jeep's coming. They hit them on the rump to get them to go. They load them up more than you can imagine. But they just keep going and going. You know what I haven't found is a donkey that has a name. No one names their animals here. These are work animals, not a pet. Anyway, this is Tracy Eaton, making a you-know-what of myself from Afghanistan. We came across a boy and his donkeys while traveling along a steep hillside. Our driver was impatient. We traveled down the hill and stopped at the river. We talked to smugglers who picked up supplies in Taliban-controlled villages, then ferried them across the river and past the front lines. Dangerous work, but worth it, one smuggler told me. If the Taliban catch me, I'm sure they'll jail me, torture me, and force me to fight the war for them. We watched as one man negotiated to have his donkeys taken across. Yep, that's right, more donkeys. Who says war is bad for business? Business is good, the goods are flowing and they're coming right across the river. Before leaving the river crossing, a man played music for us. It's probably a good thing we didn't understand the lyrics.
xarkarlarni talaydi. Getting around in this dusty place wasn't easy. Cheryl joked that the roads were doing permanent harm to her body. They are beyond bad. A 30 mile trip takes one and a half hours by Jeep and turns my spine to jello. We tried horseback to see if that would be any better. Here you get an idea what it's like to come back from the front lines by horseback. How you doing? The American bombing campaign began on October 7 of 2001. Long-range B-52s, B-1 Lancers, and stealth aircraft began dropping bombs. U.S. and British submarines launched Tomahawk cruise missiles, and F-14 Tomcats unleashed laser-guided weapons. This was the start of Operation Enduring Freedom. The plastic windows of our makeshift quarters shook violently when bombs weighing as much as a ton landed before dawn. Some bombs left craters where there didn't seem to be targets. Most of the Taliban were retreating, and so we usually didn't see much of a fight when visiting the front lines. Later, we had to retreat ourselves because our gas generator fried one of Cheryl's power adapters, giving her no way to charge her laptop. I sent this video report to one of my editors. Okay, this is reality TV for you. It's been very frustrating. We get sick about every other day or every third day. We seem to have a crisis um, every third day or so, whether it's getting sick, having equipment breakdown, not being able to get where we want to go, having a bad weather problem, a dust storm, or whatever. You're sick, you're trying not to get sick, you've got dust all over you, the logistics, no electricity, no running water, trying to find electricity, having your equipment get blown up or screwed up by faulty generators, which happened to us. So anyway, we're pulling out today. We're going to go back to Tajikistan and figure out what to do. It's been really t a tough story to crack. The uh, front lines here are kind of inactive. Uh, you know, mortar shells fall every once in a while, and there's volleying going back and forth between the two sides. But it's not like there's a ton of action. There's no big offensive, so it's real hard to get a good, good story out of that. The other problem is trying to understand this place. We have interpreters who um, aren't all that fluent all the time, and they can't penetrate levels of meaning that we need as journalists to figure out what's going on here. So it's been very, very difficult. What we have to do now is uh, hide our money, because there's border guards who try to extort money from you. So I have a money belt that has several thousand dollars in it, and then the rest of the money, I'm going to put it in an envelope and tape it with big, big, thick plastic clear tape and tape it to the inside of my underwear. That's going to be comfortable. Cheryl and I went back to Tajikistan, where there really is a laundry soap called Barf. Cheryl went on to Dubai to get a new adapter for her laptop. I stayed in Tajikistan and bought a $15 ring from a vendor. She said it would protect me from bullets when I went back to Afghanistan. I wore the ring every day. The fight had intensified by the time we returned to Afghanistan a few days later. One morning, a sniper's bullet smacked a sand embankment just behind me. I didn't recognize the strange whistling sound of the bullets and didn't realize we were under fire. An Afghan commander yelled something and I ducked. I asked a soldier what it felt like to be shot at. He doesn't care about this, I don't care, he says. His commander had told him to hide from the enemy. 
good way according to the commander. Yeah, that those people must not see him. Just he should be able to see them. Cheryl had some scary moments of her own. After running from what were believed to be advancing Taliban soldiers, she told her translator that her feet were killing her. Seeing the dangers of combat photography, the translator replied, Cheryl, you are killing you, not your feet. Cheryl also had to deal with sexual harassment. It's been a real bear working here as a woman. I've been poked, prodded, and grabbed more times than I've experienced in my entire life. I've been stared at in the most shameless fashion on the street, on the front lines, and in our vehicle, where men and boys pace their faces against the glass for a stolen glimpse of the female species uncovered. It's become a daily occurrence to be molested. Today, the highlight was a poke in the rear with a stick. I've instructed my translator to tell the soldiers that they represent Islam to me and they make themselves look bad when they are disrespectful. Cheryl said a French journalist told her, Only prostitutes go uncovered. So when Afghan men see a woman uncovered, they think I have offered myself to them. Wow, that's pretty deep stuff. While we dealt with these everyday problems on the ground, U.S.-backed Afghan leaders were negotiating with the Taliban and sometimes paying them off with U.S. government money. We know that now. We didn't know it then. The fighting for some people to leave their villages. I don't think the soldiers were always happy to see us. We rushed out several times when we heard Taliban were about to surrender. Finally, the first of the surrendering Taliban soldiers began to arrive. Some of the soldiers were tense or upset. One soldier grew angry after someone evidently yanked off his turban. He grabbed a grenade launcher and threatened to use it before the other soldiers calmed him down. We were eager to hear from the Taliban fighters. One fighter put a flower in his gun barrel. A photographer thought that was silly. It wasn't always clear if soldiers were attacking or surrendering, and that sometimes caused panic. me, dozens of Taliban have just turned themselves in. Just a short while ago, jeeps and trucks rolled up. They were covered with mud. You know that they're Taliban vehicles when they're covered with mud. That's how the Taliban hide them. These Taliban were surrendering. And I found something incredible in talking to some of them. Uh, many had never even heard of the World Trade Center and Pentagon uh, bombings. So I asked, well, why are you fighting? And they say, well, we're fighting because our commanders told us to. You have to understand, in Afghanistan, the liter illiteracy rate is very, very high. You have a lot of illiterate farmers, jobless people, who have nothing to do than to fight. So that's one thing that's happening. You have a lot of people caught in between their, their commanders, their bosses, and the forces of geopolitics, which are much stronger than they are. This is Tracy Eaton, reporting from northern Afghanistan. but there's a lot of tension here. There have been some uh, little flare-ups between the Taliban who are turning themselves in and soldiers from the Northern Alliance. Sometimes I sent videos back to my boss telling him what we were seeing. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about what's on the tapes. Uh, 
first you have the arrival of the Taliban, and it's just a, a mad kind of chaotic scene. You have uh, these mud-smeared tanks and Datsuns and four-wheel drive uh, uh, Soviet-built jeeps just uh, roaring into these villages and just throwing up huge dust clouds all over the place. And, and they are all heavily armed. They haven't given up their weapons. They go into villages that are controlled by the Northern Alliance. And uh, in, in one case, these uh, uh, little convoy of maybe six or seven vehicles came tearing up. And the, some of the Alliance people didn't know what the heck was going on. And before you know it, they have their weapons pointed at each other. Then it subsides, it, they calm down, and uh, they kind of get on with business. And all they're doing is going through the territory there and, and you know, passing through this gauntlet of, of uh, little villages, of uh, roads filled with donkeys and women wearing those long fl flowing white uh, burkas and borkas, uh, as Cheryl calls them. And, uh, and so they get through and uh, then they're greeted by all these Northern Alliance soldiers. And there's such a lack of information. Some of the Alliance people don't know if these guys are attacking, if they're coming to surrender, or what's going on. The day before yesterday, when a group of Taliban arrived to surrender, uh, it was bedlam. They had, uh, there were fights broke out over who gets to have the jeeps that the Taliban arrive in. And so they got into these, this huge ruckus and a number of times shots were fired and people hit the dirt. Despite the chaos, some soldiers were hospitable. Some of them are, are, are just incredibly kind and, and friendly. Uh, here in the midst of, they're, they're getting ready to attack the, the Taliban uh, the other day and one commander says to me, well, hey, well, if you're not doing anything, come on over to my house. I live right over here and we'll kill a goat and you can stay over for a while. Uh, it, it's really something. A lot of the soldiers live right in the area. A lot of the soldiers from opposing sides know each other. So when you get a surrender, you might get old friends meeting each other. And they greet each other, they hug each other. And I've asked a number of them, don't you hate this guy? I mean, just yesterday he was trying to kill you. It's like, no, no, no. Yesterday he may have been my enemy, but today he's my friend. And that's how they feel. You know, this is, uh, they, another guy said, we're all brothers now. <laughs> Women, as you know, are pretty much cut off from any kind of, or, or, or from almost any kind of role in society, uh, out in public at least. And when they do go around in public, they have to be completely covered uh, with cloth from head to toe. Some boys are thrust into war at an early age. One told me he'd fight the Taliban until his death. He's 15 years old? Yeah, he's 15 years old. And he joined when? Six months ago. The, the grunt level soldier uh, usually gets to eat every day boiled rice. And I asked several of them, well, how much do you make? What kind of money do you make? They said, well, enough to buy, but to buy boiled rice. And yet they, they are so obedient and subservient to their commanders. The commander says, uh, well, we're going to switch sides. So en masse, they all switch sides. I asked a number of soldiers, uh, why did you change sides? Or, or I asked a Taliban, you know, why did you turn yourself in? Well, because my commander told me to. They just blindly follow their, their commanders. You get the sense of these hapless peasants, many of them illiterate, following around uh, their commanders, in some cases to their death. You know, you really get the sense that these people are used. I had a feeling that some of the Afghan warlords were competing to see who could be the first to take Kunduz, the Taliban's northern stronghold. They want the spoils of war. There's millions of dollars of uh, tanks, weapons, artillery at stake. And so whoever gets to Kunduz first, whoever controls the situation, gets the most arms, gets the most armaments, and they also get soldiers. Many soldiers who surrendered were allowed to keep their weapons. The prisoners sat in the back of trucks. We wondered what was going to happen to them. 
Şöyle ne şöyle kadar. Gel bak gel şöyle. Gel There was a lot of yelling and arguing. Better than bullets, I guess. My translator was Najibullah, an English teacher who lived in Talakan. His dream was to earn enough money to buy a satellite dish to watch news and soccer on BBC television. His 19-year-old nephew, Esma Tula, was Cheryl's all-around bodyguard. His primary purpose, Cheryl said, was to protect her bottom from undisciplined Mujahideen. Finally, the attack on the Taliban-controlled town of Kunduz began. The last Taliban stronghold is under attack. The only thing that's not clear is just how many Taliban are going to fight. Thousands could surrender. But a lot of the hardcore Muslim supporters of the Taliban are not giving up. These are people from Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and other countries who still support the Taliban, still support its cause. We followed the tanks into Kunduz. Gun battles broke out early that day. The Taliban shot a 25-year-old soldier named Azizullah in the left arm. We went into town and they shot at us, he said. At least 50 of our soldiers were killed. What happened there? We saw dead and wounded soldiers on the streets. One injured soldier sat in a broken down Russian jeep. Radiator fluid dripped onto the ground. Blood streamed down his neck. This man needs a ride to the hospital, a friend yelled to a passing jeep. I'm not going that way, shouted the driver, putting his foot on the accelerator. Some of the dead were tossed into trucks. Soldiers paraded Taliban fighters through the streets. The soldiers seemed a little confused about where to take the prisoners. We followed the prisoners because we wondered what was going to happen to them. Eventually they wound up in a little room. Soldiers took the prisoners' turbans and used them to tie their arms together. They sat on the floor. Outside, people celebrated. A 60-year-old man named Haji Jan Mohammed grabbed a poster of the assassinated leader, Ahmad Massoud. Up with Massoud, he yelled, down with Pakistan. Down the street, soldiers laughed and poked at the body of a Taliban fighter. These people are like savage dogs, a disgusted shopkeeper said. We found out later that more than 8,000 Taliban soldiers surrendered in Kunduz in November of 2001. Among those captured was John Walker Lind, the so-called American Taliban. Human rights activists say anywhere from 250 to 3,000 prisoners were shot or suffocated to death in December of 2001. 
commanders congratulated each other after another group of Taliban surrendered. Famed war photographer James Noctway was among those covering the story. Incredibly, as many as a thousand Al-Qaeda fighters, Islamic soldiers, and Taliban commanders escaped. They boarded planes for Pakistan in the days before Kunduz fell. Pakistani leaders had asked the U.S. to allow the fighters to leave because they said their capture could cause civil unrest in Pakistan. Bush administration officials reluctantly accepted the deal. Critics later called the flights the airlift of evil. Those were stories we missed. We left Afghanistan on November 27, before all that happened. We were glad to get out of Afghanistan alive. Eight journalists were killed in the country while we were there. Some were killed at a bunker we had just visited days before. Many more U.S. soldiers have been killed in Afghanistan. The number of dead reached nearly 2,000 by April of 2012. Nearly 500 American soldiers died in Afghanistan in 2010. That compares to just 12 in 2001 when Cheryl and I were there. Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters have proven to be resilient and elusive. Marine General John Allen, the top commander in Afghanistan, said recently, We remain on track to ensure that Afghanistan will no longer be a safe haven for Al-Qaeda and will no longer be terrorized by the Taliban. Our troops know the difference that they're making every day, and the enemy feels that difference every day. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta said, We've seen the Taliban weakened, and the bottom line is, it's working. Not everyone agrees. Douglas Wissing is author of the book, Funding the Enemy, How U.S. Taxpayers Bankroll the Taliban. He contends that scandalously mismanaged aid and logistics contracts end up financing the Taliban. In April 2012, he told Time magazine that a toxic, opportunistic system developed in Afghanistan in the years after the U.S. invasion. U.S. soldiers compare it to the Mafia. Everyone's in on the take. The soldiers tell me, we are funding our own enemy. He continued, we're now spending $2 billion a week in Afghanistan. We spent $120 billion there last year. It is not doing much good. Most of the $60 billion the U.S. has spent in Afghanistan on aid and development is wasted. The U.S. mission has evolved dramatically over the years. The goal after 9-11 was to force the Taliban from power and pursue al-Qaeda fighters. Now the U.S. government is helping to rebuild a nation, boost Afghan security forces, and create a partnership with Pakistan. It hasn't been easy, particularly since some Pakistani forces provide safe haven for some Taliban militants. A classified NATO report said the Taliban's strength, motivation, funding, and tactical proficiency remained intact in 2012. Meantime, U.S. costs have mounted. Less than 30 seconds is all it takes to spend $100,000 in Afghanistan. According to a website called Cost of War, the total spent in Afghanistan as of April 2012 was more than $517 billion. The $5 million that the CIA spent in 2001 to gain the support of Afghan warlords seems almost quaint now. U.S. government war spending has soared into the hundreds of billions of dollars. The number of casualties has also climbed as brave American soldiers sacrificed their lives. But it's unclear whether the enduring freedom that they fought and died for in Afghanistan will last. The situation in Afghanistan now is much different than when I covered the fighting in 2001. Looking back at my old videotapes, I'm glad I pulled them out of the cardboard box. The videos don't capture the dust, the grime, or the smells of Afghanistan. They don't show the piercing winds or the immensity of the rugged landscape. But these bites and pixels stored in a cardboard box all these years are a snapshot in time. They're a fleeting image of what it was like in Afghanistan before the fighting escalated. Tracy Eden, Tracy Eden, Tracy Eden, Tracy Eden. Reporting from Afghanistan. From Afghanistan. From Afghanistan. From Afghanistan. From Afghanistan.